Most of the documents when I read is all about the thing. You are the authors and the writers of them. Let's not write for convenience, right? But let's write for a change. Go beyond yourselves. Sometimes I say, don't even undermine the issue of what I call you know, school university collaborations. The schools are basic, they are up there, you know, like disempowered. This thing of basic disempowers them. Ah, you are at the base. You know, what you are doing is very basic. So, but universities, you have, you have the advantage. Actually, your resources are much more better. You can make an input there that influence the systems. You know, another challenge is around what I call you know, ac academic barriers to higher education. <coughs> you know, the South African university entrants are seen to be underperforming even when compared to peers you know, in countries with a similar socioeconomic status to South Africa. This I think I've alluded to when I moved away from my paper. And this is because of the dysfunctional primary and secondary education system, which produce school graduates who have very large deficits you know, to cover when entering the university. Having said that, I'm not even saying then you can fold your arms because you are higher education. You must do something. You have, you can, you should. Another challenge is the social barriers to higher education. You know, for most first generation students, the transition to university is an enormous need across economic, social, and racial barriers. The social engagement of high school students often determines whether or not students will attend university, and once in university, whether they will persist. There's peer pressure, community perception, and access to successful university role models play an important role in motivating university access and persistence. Students do not exist in a vacuum during the course of their studies, and their social circumstances can have a massive impact on the risk of dropout or failure. Students who cannot afford you know, to travel home, as an example, you know, and, and, and are effectively homeless when the dormitories or hostels close. I don't, I don't know if you ever think about it. Look, I come from a, a, a student support background, you know, and I, I know these things if you don't know about them. And I know them even about this institution because when hostels close, we have such a diverse group of students. And it is not necessarily our problem as higher education, but unfortunately, we confronted with that. And these are some of the factors that create problems Unfortunately, in the classroom or the lecture hall, this is Financial barriers to higher education as a challenge. I want to move as fast as I can. So, you know the issue of finance and so on. And, and even with what the government is doing to, to increase participation, and they do funding, that funding is just enough for you know, the fees and all, they, it doesn't alleviate the financial problems. Actually, some of you would know, some of the students, even with the NESFAS funding, okay, not yet, and not someone in South Africa, but someone else, when the families should you know, support their studies all, it has to be stressed even for other purposes because they probably even have other means supported by a textbook or pay some good fees for a single summer because they just give up with and these are the problems that we have. Now you have a good story, man. If someone is on the but how did they call this guy? She tell us you know, how bright the future is and, you know, and all that. Now, how do we make a difference as I
come to the close with the remaining uh, 10 minutes. Number one, career guidance and counseling. Managing the transition from high school to university. This is very, very important. Because one of the issues much talked about is the area of students underprepared for higher education. Apart from you know, linguistic preparation, <coughs> digital literacy, uh, quantitative literacy, and all those kind of things, the baseline, I think, is career guidance and counseling. <coughs> Students need to know through their subjects what is it that they will end up doing at the university. And as they are in university, they should know. As I open chapter one of a course called Somatology on one, what is it that I will become? And this is very, very important. Also, talking about counseling, the non cognitive factors that impact on learning need to be really looked into because what's the use of, of uh, knowing that one plus one is two when I'm not really feeling well in my mind, when I'm not motivated and all those kind of things. And as a university or higher education, we need to really put an effort in making sure that students receive enough career guidance. Not the first instant when they come here, it is too late, and we have to figure out ourselves. When we talk about these things, how can we make them ready and prepared as they come into the university? I want to say, a student who knows, I am doing grade 11, this subject. This will lead me to this institution. After that, I will become the, I, I call it self-regulation. You don't have to tell that person, hey, wake up and study, because they know. Through this, I will get here, and I will be that. And this is what Kira Counseling is all about. Number two, making a difference. We need to make you know, some small adaptations to make it financial risk. Somebody said, you know, actually told me a story about the university somewhere, where you know, they declared that that university textbook free for first years by making use of human people from teaching with technology, or the arts, you know, targeting the subject material and all that electronically at first year level. At least if you are an author, you will get something from second year of course. And so on, you know. And I, I don't want to say a lot about that because there's issues around you know, textbooks and Second edition, third edition, which is first edition. <laughs> but, okay, yes. Technology can alleviate some of the families, at least the first year. So, somebody said with me a story where they make a declaration. At first year, textbook free. And you know what you can do better than I can. You know, the body does, the books, the whatever. I don't even know what all the aspects of you know. This all can alleviate the financial you know, risk of our students and all that. The identification of innovative solutions for students with disabilities. Very important because I talked about the diversity of students. Now, there is this concept of universal design. Actually, I hate it when they say, you know, the university is accommodating students with disabilities. That's offensive. Because it's like, when you accommodate somebody, that person does not belong there. You know that? When I go to my travels, because I don't live in Cape Town, I look for accommodation. And people accommodate me because they know I don't belong there. You know what I mean? So, if there's a change that we have to make, let's stop accommodating students with disabilities because they belong there. 
Whose place is it if you're accommodated? You can't, I can't be accommodated in my house. So let's embrace this concept of universal design in our minds, in our lecture rooms, you know. Uh, uh, present our materials and everything for, to suitable for everyone. Because this issue of accommodating students with disabilities, as I was praying for this preparation, it came. This is a reference to technology. I don't have time to explain what is all of this is because I've left for three minutes. The issue of early identification of risk. Someone calls it automated early warnings. We must do it. Don't wait for results. Actually, a report means nothing. A report comes in too late. It's too late. The, the exam result means there's nothing that you can do, actually. They are too late. So let's get into a mode of early identification of risk. And this is where the academics are very important. And I'm happy because 80% of you here are lecturers. Don't disappoint me and tell me you have excluded them. Because one of my recommendations is let's have an integrated student support approach. The silo mentality, you know, uh, actually, when I, okay, you know why I left TT? Because I worked in a department and they used to say this is a non academic department. And I thought I've read the same books. <laughs> Just because I'm not teaching, say I'm not academic. Even today, guys, I would not come there. <laughs> How can you be non-academic when you are working with other principles? How can you be non-educated when you're dealing with education? And and this thing, psychology could just affect us. The us and them. But you want to increase their success. We have a common, common, common focus, the student. And, and that, that's why when I talk to lecturers, you know, this issue of being subject specialists <coughs> must come to an end. We specialize in educating the student. Not the sub you know, so much focus on actually higher education research and whatever, mastering the subject and so on. That is why the biggest, you know, uh, uh, losses in terms of success because sometimes we lose sight of some So let's put in measures. I've got suggestions here, you know, early learning, early identification. From first year, first day, there must be ways of tracking the students' performance and put in integrated measures, approaches where everybody that is involved, from curriculum people, uh, people in the school support, people in counseling, people in the faculties. They can do something, and I can tell you, prevention is better than cure. Uh, uh, number five, curriculum innovation. You know? uh, I don't even have time to talk about that, because the reason why we have curriculum development pipelines it's not because we are introducing a new subject every year. Are you really doing that? No. But it is because curriculum will not be static. It cannot. What was yesterday is supposed to change. And we are engaged in research to change these things, to innovate and respond to what is currently happening. And for me, curriculum innovation is to make what we design, what we teach relevant for what is happening on the ground. The issue of professional development for academics and for lecturers. One of the focus areas of the quality management project, and I was so happy, is the enhancement of academics as teachers. Somebody said, you know, lecturers or academics are disciplinary specialists. And, and, and if I have to, yeah, to reflect on the quality management process, there's a need for, 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 for development of teaching skills. 
you know, there's this thing where if you have a class of a thousand students, you should get one when your attendance registers are always at half. But I think most of our academics are unconcerned about that. But maybe the, the, is the problem with the students. They have too much to do and whatever. They're not motivated and all that. But if, if I'm a lecturer, I should ask myself questions. Sometimes they will collect the outcoming factors, something that makes them not to come, to stay where they stay, not in class. But what if there are push factors in the classroom? Because I just know that physiologists have done two PhDs in physiology, postdoc, doc in specialized physiology. This I know very well. But do you know how to teach? You must ask ourselves those kind of critical questions. Why do students not come to class? Why do they fail the courses? Why is there a disconnect between a student and a lecturer? So these are the things we must engage in. And, and lastly, a holistic and integrated approach to student support. Someone said, it is one thing to hold high expectations. It is another to provide support for the student's need to achieve them. Because of time, and when I conclude, I quote from Mary MacLeod Bethune, who says, we have a powerful potential in our youth, and we must have the courage to change all ideas and practices so that we may direct their power towards good ends. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. planning to do postgraduate studies. Okay, I think I've got a good audience. <laughs> um, what I will cover, I just want to reflect on the type of plagiarism that uh, our students commit and that what I've seen. I just also want to report on the dark force that would assist them. Now, I particularly use the word the dark force because the popularity of um, Star Wars, and which has been uh, shown on our television again. And then I want to make uh, a very simple recommendation and conclude with one slide. And I hope to take you through a tour of plagiarism from the ex how I've experienced and how I've seen it, and how this would actually impact on the quality of our work and on the credibility of institutions. But I must also acknowledge that the text that I've used and also the images that I project here is what I've taken from the web and which I've also taken verbatim from certain issues which is publicly available. Now, plagiarism is prevalent in all sorts of fields. For example, this is just uh, two examples. The left-hand one is a pack designed by uh, Unilever, the right one is a pack designed by a South African manufacturer in KwaZulu-Natal and they lost their case. They had to change the pack and withdraw it. That is just one example. 
We find it, for example, in fashion design. The person on the right hand side is a South African fashion designer which denies that he has copied the design on the left. Um, I do believe it's a copy. And then, of course, we are aware what's happening to some of our public officials which claim to have certain qualifications but do not have this. Um, and this is a serious concern. So it's not just from the bottom up, it comes down from the top as well. And we are all aware what's happening in our public institutions as well. But what is really concerning is the confidence that people have and the assurance that they have um, to display something which they do not have. And of course, it all starts at our universities. There was a couple of newspaper reports in 2014. It appeared in online news reports on newspapers as well about plagiaristic practices and students have to prosecute it. But when I looked at these figures, I say to myself, the only university that really took some action was the Northwest University. It is my experience that uh, the majority of students when allowed will plagiarize and that would include postdoctoral work. Even cases where I work together with my postdoc students, students that I'm on first term basis, which are my colleagues, which are aware of plagiaristic practices that I should not do this, involuntary fall into the trap. And when it happens, they say, how did this happen? There was even a case earlier on the year, I prepared a paper and I checked it for plagiarism. There I found a section which I've plagiarized unknowingly from another source. And I say to myself, how can this happen? So it's not always a deliberate attempt to cheat and to steal. It just comes, it just happens small sections. Uh, our institution at the time also replied to the media but they uh, did not provide any figures. I believe this was the right move not to bring our institution into disrepute. And this is not unique to South Africa if you read about, uh, if you read the University News and the Chronicle of Higher Education you will find that these practices are prevalent in all parts of the world, especially the East and in particular in countries where English is not the first language. This is also uh, an issue that uh, inspires students to do this. And of course I would agree with that and I think all of you would agree with me that we don't need half-baked graduates because it produces half-baked lecturers and then of course you know the saying is if you can't do it you teach if you can't teach you lecture and if you can't lecture you become the minister of education or something like that <laughs> then we land up with people in decision making positions in South Africa um, that make decisions about things that they do not know because we cannot read and we can't infer and we can't synthesize from scientific information to put information together because we plagiarize our undergraduate work, our postgraduate work and that's how we train our students and we condone that. For example, our qualification verifications uh, organization in South Africa, they report uh, that about 13% of all the work that they've got to verify is false. So the issue of cheating and plagiaristic practices are all interwoven with each other. For example, there's an interesting case that the Mail and Guardian dug up a few years ago. A certain person claimed to be a professor. Um, however, it's difficult to establish where he obtained it from. Then they came up with this. He presented a paper at a conference somewhere at an institution and based on the strength of his paper, they awarded him a professorship. Um, however, they also presented all the evidence that large part of it was copied from someone else's work. They also provided all that evidence. And if you go to that particular institution's website, you see it's a dead website for several years. And I question whether such an institution has actually got the power to confer postgraduate degrees and professorships. But there's hope. I remember one of my friends, he was in religious studies and a little bit of a lunatic from my perspective, but other people believe he was very close to number one. Uh, never did any studies and he went overseas and came back as a doctor. So, of course, when you come back as a doctor and you speak about evolution, you attract a lot of people and you can ask them 50 rand to attend your services, but you've never even uh, passed uh, archaeology 101. So that's a particular case. Um, so it also depends what the doctor and the professor is. Like one of my colleagues mentioned, peanut professors. And I thought, yeah, that is a very good term. We might have peanut professors. 
This particular gentleman, remember it's not just a problem to our South Africa, he was picked to become the uh, replacement of Merkel, the number one in Germany. However, his doctoral degree was withdrawn at a certain stage. And there's a group of plagiarism hunters in Germany. They go after all the high profile politicians. They get hold of their work and they check where they've copied and stolen work. And he became one of the victims. He was such a popular man, especially among the young people, when he appeared on stage, they played tracks from ACDC. Typical square jaw, the he man, he's going to be the leader of Germany. And of course, all has disappeared because he copied parts of his doctoral work. And his claim was, or his excuse was, that was the practice at the time at that university. And I actually believe in it was the practice at the time at the university where he studied. Even presidents in countries lose their jobs. 2012, even research ministers as well. It's all in the news. You can read about this. Now, this is quite interesting. A high-profile person in Germany as well, they talk about plagiaristic practices. It's not that she copy and pasted. It. It's not that she stole work from other people. If you look at it, only, 60, only on 60 of the 351 pages, there were cases of plagiaristic practices. And that was the end of her career. And remember, Germany is the leading country in Western Europe. And of course, we won't talk about what's happening in South Africa. But really, what intrigues me is that when you get appointment in a big organization like that, surely someone has got to check the credentials and make sure. And they would know that you're making mistakes. It was once one of my colleagues was involved in ousting a VC of a university many years ago. And they found out that particular person had two doctoral degrees that were the same. Went overseas, came back with two doctoral degrees from American universities. And I asked him, Cecil, how did you find this out? He says, well, every time he spoke, they realized this person was not trained in research. You know, the conversation, the arguments, the things that he said, they realized there was something amiss with this person. So what the person actually did is copied a doctoral dissertation from UNISA, went overseas, submitted it to universities, and came back as the savior for the university. But of course, when they saw the person's conduct and behavior and the things that he said, they realized there's something not wrong here. Uh, that was the end of that person's life. 